I V M. Innovation in food is progressing at an extremely rapid pace. Blockchain, traceability, digital marketplaces, robotics, hydroponics, drone deliveries, the breadth of technology being applied to problems within the agricultural and food sector is breathtaking. And nowhere is this more apparent than in the alternative protein sphere. The pace of investment, product launches and proliferation across continents has been hugely encouraging. You could say that smart protein is growing up and if it's done right, that's going to be a big win for the planet. But it's not just the growth of foods that replace animal sourced meat, eggs and dairy without all of the land, water, energy and greenhouse gas implications that's hugely encouraging. It's also the application of these technologies to problems we talk about all the time on Feeding 10 Billion. The pressing problems which disproportionately affect the developing world. One of those pressing problems is of course malnutrition. We're talking about iron deficiency anemia, stunting, wasting, neural tube defects, debilitating conditions that impair an entire population's ability to live thriving, fulfilled lives. It's an intergenerational problem that traps households and communities in a cycle of poverty, and nowhere is this more acutely seen than in India. India is home to a third of the world's total stunted children. while nearly half of all under 5 child mortality in the country is attributable to undernutrition we've had an anemia control program in place for 50 years and still face the world's highest burden of the disease any country cannot aim to attain economic and social development goals without addressing the issue of malnutrition and there's a huge business case to be made here as well a recent report from the uk government think tank chatham house finds that businesses in low and middle income countries collectively lose between 130 and 850 billion dollars a year through malnutrition related productivity reductions which is equivalent to between 0.4 and 2.9% of those economies total combined gdp and that's just the businesses now malnutrition in children occurs as a complex interplay among various factors like poverty maternal health illiteracy diseases like diarrhea home environment dietary practices hand washing and other hygiene practices but one of the primary reasons for the persistence of malnutrition is of course nutrition the development sector and governments have been hard at work for decades trying to solve the intergenerational cycle of undernourished adolescent women poor nutrition in the first 1000 days of a child's life and all the ensuing problems Any parent or even general citizens of low and middle income countries will know that mega food companies like Nestle have been trying to address these problems with fortified infant nutrition products for a long time. You may also know that the picture is complicated by the fact that women often experience difficulty breastfeeding, that they experience huge guilt and pressure to feed their children the right way, on which by the way there is little consensus, and that the persistent anemia and other nutrition challenges which women face prevent their children from accessing all the nutrients they need from that breast milk in the first place what you may not know is that as debates about the length of breastfeeding and whether supplementation is the right thing to do rage over 10% of cow's milk production globally is actually absorbed by the infant nutrition market now as we've talked about on season 2 of feeding 10 billion the conventional dairy sector continues to be transformed by alternative protein solutions which are far superior from a sustainability standpoint so how will this picture evolve today's guests on feeding 10 billion are part of a small group of early pioneers in an incredibly exciting category which may answer many of these critical questions biomilk is a north carolina based company bringing real human breast milk to market by cultivating the mammary cells which produce that breast milk it's a process that can provide a superior product with all the quality and intricate complex blend of nutrients in human breast milk without the environmental implications of cow's milk in short a win win michel eger is a food scientist by training driven to solve global food security and malnutrition she has an mba from the fuqua school of business at duke university in north carolina She worked for General Mills in dairy fermentation, formulation and processing and most recently for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on their global nutrition team 
where I worked together with her on a project focused on unlocking the potential of millets in innovative food applications. As co-founder and CEO of BioMilk, Michelle's goal is to develop animal-free products to feed infants around the world in a better way. Leila Strickland has a PhD in cell biology from Boston College with over 10 years of experience conducting original research on fundamental cellular processes. She was part of the startup 108 Labs prior to BioMilk and has been a medical writer. Leila is passionate about developing novel applications for cell culture technology to address the world's most pressing problems. As a scientific pioneer within this space, she is co-founder and CSO at BioMilk. I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the communication specialist at the Good Food Institute India. And I'm Varun Deshpande, managing director at the Good Food Institute India. And you're listening to Feeding 10 Billion. Michelle and Leila, welcome to the show. Michelle, you've been a business school graduate from Duke University and you have a background in the alternative protein sector, especially on the plant-based side. Some of the work that you did with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I wanted to ask you, what made you focus on this particular area of cultured breast milk? Well, fate is what made me focus here is what I like to say a little bit. You know, I've always had a passion for trying to find ways to feed our planet sustainably and ethically. And I had always been really, really focused on malnutrition as it pertained to kids, but not necessarily infants. I'd always been kind of like school age kids, school feeding programs, access, trying to discuss through stunting, you know, five years up. And both with my exposure at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to the first 1,000 days of life and how vital those fundamental building blocks really are to set in place early. And just my own personal experience starting to see earlier and earlier issues, both under and overfed kids by the time they're three or four years old. It was really clear that we had to think upstream if we were going to find solutions to global malnutrition. And that at the point where we were intervening, it was just too late. You know, we were frequently, we'll see programs where we're trying to bulk up on calories and trying to get the right nutrient levels to children that have already been in stunted bodies for years. We just can't get them to a place where they're nutritionally healthy because their bodies are used to being starved and vice versa. We see a lot of obesity rates, especially in countries with middle income and income class growing quickly. And you know, having both problems simultaneously is really strong indicator that we have to talk earlier about how we're going to set fundamental nutrition. And that starts with breast milk. So I was lucky enough in kind of my soul searching of where do I want to work in this space and how do I think I can use my talents to applicably help feed the world. A mutual friend introduced Layla and I, and it was kind of like the clouds parted and the heavens sung. And it was clear that we were supposed to work together. We had both been learning things that were beneficial to each other and we're going to be able to really change the world by finding each other. That's a great introduction to Leila. So Leila, basically the same question. You've been a medical writer. You have a PhD in cell biology from Boston College. You've been in the entrepreneurial space before with your previous startup. So could you tell us what it was like to join forces to found Biomilk and how did you decide this was an idea whose time had come? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, I've been working on this for a little while now, or at least thinking about it and trying to think about what kind of business we would might want to make or what kind of applications we would want to see out in the world with this technology that I've been working on going back to 2013. So as I was finishing up my postdoc and finding a number of circumstances in my life kind of converging and pushing me in this direction, one was that, you know, as a researcher, I'd always really studied cellular physiology and how cells control particular processes in space and time that has ended up being a background that we really are leveraging with the technology we're developing now. And then also at that time, I became a mother and my son was born and I had always anticipated breastfeeding him. I thought that would be the best thing for him and hadn't thought honestly too much about it beyond that during my pregnancy until he was born and was unable to really effectively breastfeed and found myself pretty distraught by that experience and forced to consider options that I really hadn't thought about before and started really studying infant formulas and wasn't thrilled with my choices at the time and felt a whole range of just kind of fraught experiences as a new mom trying to figure out the best way to feed my kid. 
And at the same time, people were starting to talk about making food from cells and people had talked about making meat from cells most famously, but also other animal products, leather and things like this. And so milk wasn't yet on the list, but it was a really exciting possibility for me, both based on my background and on my personal challenges with breastfeeding my own children. So by 2013, I was really pretty obsessed (laughs) with the idea and had some thoughts about how you might be able to grow the cells that synthesize the majority of the components of milk outside the body and be able to collect that product for nutritional purposes. And so together with my husband, we spent a little bit of time here in the Raleigh-Durham area starting up a lab. We bought a bit of used equipment on eBay and started growing bovine mammary cells at first, mainly because the tissue was really cheap and easy to obtain. We could get it from a local slaughterhouse and go play around and see how we could get these cells to grow and learn what conditions they like and how they could be manipulated in culture. And spent some years doing that while kind of developing the outline for the process to collect milk from these cells. And by 2019, really, I think just a number of things kind of came together. Like you said, I've been working as a medical writer in the pharmaceutical industry and doing a lot of consulting with pharma companies and had been exposed to biologics manufacturing and some of the technologies that are used there. And that had all kind of come together to just encourage me that this idea that we've been playing around with so long might actually be worth taking a real stab at. So we put together a proof of concept experiment and started working with Michelle and trying to raise support for the technology, basically. So we came together last fall, the end of last summer, actually. We're really coming up on about a year here that Michelle and I've been working together more formally, which is amazing. (laughs) It's incredible. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I got to be here. And to be clear, she leaves out the best part of the story every time. The (laughs) getting tissue cheap and easily is slipping the guy a 20 out on the slaughter (laughs) line and getting an utter warm and taking it to her car, chopping it apart uh, and being able to pull cell samples out. So when you talk about a true and genuine entrepreneur, she she definitely fits the bill. She doesn't give herself enough credit. (laughs) Leila, that's an amazing anecdote. And I didn't know that you were sort of fiddling with this idea for years before you managed to sort of launch this startup. And and that's an amazing anecdote about growing those bovine mammary cells in a lab way before this company was a twinkle in your eye, basically. But, you know, it's based on a lot of consumer data or market data that shows that moms like you often struggle to feed their children and they turn to formula and statistics that you quoted show that more than four out of five or rather 84% of moms in the U.S. are not able to meet that minimum stipulated six-month feeding period that's required for their kids, right? So beyond your own personal experience, how did you find that it was important to address a more sustainable alternative for this group of consumers? And could you speak a bit to what kind of impact this might have, particularly when it comes to, say, climate change or the environment? Yeah, we think about, you know, a lot of different ways that this particular product could have a number of different impacts. In fact, you know, it to date, there's no way to get human milk except for from a woman who's lactating. And so if that uh, is no longer the case, then there, there are a lot of things that could really be affected. One is that there would be plenty of milk for babies, which today there's actually not. We have milk shortages in milk banks. There are premature infants who can't breastfeed and desperately need that nutrition. And as Michelle introduced as well, you know, throughout the developing world and, and in many communities, even in the United States, the challenges that women face with breastfeeding, while maybe different, are just as real and force us to make just as many trade-offs. And so I think that, you know, from a social perspective, you can see a whole number of impacts that this could have both on on parents and caregivers who would now be empowered with the new option, knowing that they can provide their children with the optimal nutrition. And also, as you point out, the infant formulas that we feed are based on bovine milk, which is compositionally not the same as human milk and requires (laughs) collecting this product from animal agriculture and all of the impacts that come along with that. And so being able to reduce those numbers and reduce that impact, there's a real opportunity to address issues like water usage and greenhouse gas production by taking animals out of that process. I think one thing that's important to note for a product like this is 
so often we want consumers to make decisions based on the climate change impacts of their choices, but it's really hard to quantifiably remind a consumer of that without guilting them, right? Like we have to say, this is the amount of water that your choice has used, or this is the amount of CO2 that it's produced. And one of the beautiful things about our product is we get to lean in on the fact that parents want to do right by their children. We get to provide better nutritional options than what could be bought off the shelf today. And they get to feel really comfortable and excited and proud of having another opportunity or another option in the space besides just the binary choice of breastfeeding or infant formula from cows. And that really means that they get kind of a double win. They get to help their children and do best by their families and not destroy the planet in the process. So for us, it's a very particular kind of space that we don't talk a lot about the climate change side of it because we know parents are already inundated with a lot of guilt and shame in the decisions that they're having to make and how to feed their kids. And so we get to kind of remove that additional element of frustration by just making it climate neutral for them out of the gate and letting them make the decision based on that it's the right thing to do for their child nutritionally. I guess this is our version of doing this, but I want to shout that from the rooftops because I mean, a lot of people think about this entire space from the context of reducing or replacing, right? Like thinking about, okay, let's make a simple switch, not a sacrifice. And that's fantastic. What's happening globally in the plant-based food sector, you know, I mean, chickpeas, not chicken, wasn't working. Broccoli, not beef, wasn't working. Swap out the beef burger for the plant-based burger. That is genuinely fantastic. It's having and will have a huge impact over time, especially as it actually begins to start displacing animal meat in a bigger way, right? But I do think that one of the major reasons to switch to new methods of production is that the products that are produced by these new methods of production are superior for various reasons in terms of their supply chain, in terms of being able to determine what comes out of them and their nutrition completeness. There's so much stuff that goes into that, right? I want to get to the crux of this and what is most exciting here. And I'm sure most listeners are interested in this piece as well. Can you talk us through the technology here? So we know, of course, that it is quite analogous in a certain sense to cultivating cells for meat. But could yeah. you talk a little bit to, you know, to all of these things, the cost, the accessibility, how you source the cells, and you know, how you replicate all the components of breast milk? I'll let Layla do the nerding out because this is definitely her corner of the world. Well, what's really wonderful is that our process actually just leverages, you know, decades of rigorous research on mammary cells based on breast cancer research and other basic science. So we actually have many decades of experience growing these cells outside of the body. In fact, the production of milk components from these cells has regularly been used throughout the literature really as an assay to confirm that the cells are behaving normally. And so people will, throughout the biomedical literature, grow mammary cells and stimulate them with a hormone and check to make sure that they're synthesizing the protein casein, one of the most abundant proteins in milk. And that's seen by the scientific community as evidence that, okay, these cells are working and operating normally. And so we have been, of course, benefited from this, you know, rich literature on mammary tissue, but also other similar cell types uh, have been used in sort of three-dimensional cell culture work and getting into the field of regenerative medicine and how do we do more complex cell culture and grow more complex, really whole tissues and even organs. And so intestinal epithelia and kidney epithelia and corneal epithelia in the eye. These are all similar cell types that have similar properties and behaviors and that we know a lot about. And so really our process involves some very standard cell culture techniques. Frankly, we collect the tissue either in a primary state or can use immortalized cells. And um, we grow them in bioreactors that have been around for quite some time and that we're now working on some very important customizations and optimizations for our own specific application, but really talking about technology that's existed for quite a while in its earliest sense and works well for this purpose. And what's nice about it is that we're able to grow these cells at a very high density. We're able to grow them in a way that allows them to carry out their inherent biological behaviors and activities. This mammary epithelial cell you know, undertakes the biosynthesis of thousands of unique molecules. I'm always saying that I can't think of another more biosynthetically active cell type. I don't think there would be another cell maybe on the planet that makes as much diversity, as many types of molecules, or in as much quantity as the mammary epithelia, because 
it has to feed and support the development and growth of an entire organism. And so it's quite just a biosynthetic marvel. So really, our technology is based on supporting these cells doing what they've been optimized through millions of years of evolution to be able to do on their own. And in fact, actually, in the body, the mother's physiology needs to balance out her energetic and nutritional needs with those of the baby. And so there's a lot of negative regulation on milk production in the body to avoid overproducing and therefore expending the mother's resources unnecessarily. And so, you know, some of the things that we're looking at are how can we override some of that negative inhibition that happens in the body, which is not needed in a vitro system outside the body. And so we've got a number of ways that we're optimizing both the cells themselves, as well as the, you know, device and components and actual hardware of the system. And then the nutrients and cell culture media that we feed the cells, all these things have to work together to optimize the product and the whole process. And so we're at a very early stage now, but we think we have a pretty good sketch of what the requirements for the system are and have a lot of fun work to do to optimize all those parts and get them to all work together. So she did, in fact, no doubt on that answer. And I loved it. So thank you so much. I want to ask you a question. So, uh, you know, you're a women-owned, science-led, parent-centered nutrition company, really, and you're producing cultured breast milk. You recently announced you had raised three and a half million dollars in funding from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is a firm that we love, a billion dollar plus fund, which is established with limited partnership from some of the world's top business leaders, including, by the way, Mukesh Ambani, who's India's richest man. You know, Breakthrough Energy Ventures supports innovative technologies that help to address climate change. Now, obviously, Leila, you've been working on this for a very long time, and now you formed the business and you're moving forward into getting things to market. So could you give us a sense, both of you, of what funding gets deployed towards and how you take that funding and scale up your impact? Yeah, I mean, one, funding is just great to get science back on the road. So especially in the era of COVID, you know, things kind of had to slow down for a bit. And it's really exciting to be able to get Layla back into the lab and be able to get back working. So a lot of our initial funding is actually really going to building out a more robust technical team, adding headcount, adding expertise, which we're interviewing right now for. And it is overwhelmingly exciting how amazing our candidates are. I want to hire everyone. I'm probably the worst CEO ever that I just want to like give all the money away and hire all of these amazing people to try to get milk out as soon as possible to the world. And really putting a lot of our initial funding directly back into fundamental research. So working through process optimization and just trying to increase yields and then doing more fundamental research for the entire field. One of the really challenging parts about working in breast milk is that you know, we have an advisor like say babies can't run for Congress. Breast milk doesn't affect aging white men. And therefore, it really hasn't been explored in depth from a scientific perspective, much beyond the walls of infant formula companies, which keep that data proprietary. So there's a lot of fundamental research that we're excited to do to help push the entire industry forward about, you know, what are the true benefits of breast milk? How do we think about specific macro and, and micromolecules and the impacts that they have? And then what's the gold standard of breast milk? How do we expect to be able to think about what's a quality product for as many babies as possible versus what a distinct mother produces? So we have a lot of scientific work to do both for ourselves and for the world and are putting quite a bit of substantial cash behind that. And then the other thing that we're doing is starting to work out a more robust consumer design work. So we are really excited to co-create with parents and pediatricians and lactation consultants and, you know, A lot of women talk about that when you're breastfeeding or have a new child, everybody wants to tell you how to do things. It's no different when you're creating cultured breast milk. Fun fact, everybody still wants to tell you how you should be thinking about feeding children. And in this case, we actually are really excited about that. It's amazing the perspectives that are out there. We learn so much from people who don't agree with us. And so we're spending a lot of our time and effort in continuing to invest in really understanding how we come to market in a way that best fits the needs of parents and caregivers and how we are able to create a product that is where people need it, when they need it, in the form that they need it, which is a pretty lengthy process of being down in the muck, but a lot of fun. Leila, did you want to answer that? I think Michelle's answer is pretty much exactly what I would say. You know, I'm very excited to bring in a few new scientists and some additional expertise and uh, really have some extra hands and extra brains to pick as we push forward on the technological side of it. And then um, really excited and interested in these questions about, you know, how this product will be regulated 
And then the ideas about, you know, how this is a fundamentally new way of producing breast milk and how are people going to feel about that? You know, we hear a lot of responses from people and when they're first exposed to the idea. And so it's really interesting to start to engage with that process and start to get a sense of what people's concerns are and, and what people are excited about as well. So all of that is going on. <laughs> we have to be sure. reminded sometimes that the technology that we're doing or that we're working on feels like pigs flying for some people. And for us, it's just yeah. science. It's just possible. So a lot of the work we do is like regrounding ourselves. and Like, oh, that's right. If I'm telling my grandmother that I'm using a bioreactor to grow breast milk, how do I talk her through it? How do I you know, answer any of the questions she has? Because for us, it's just fundamental science. And for parts of the world, it's amazing. It seems like it shouldn't even be possible. So we have a lot of work to do. I want to so, actually get into what you said earlier about how, you know, it's kind of like what people do with moms. They always want to tell you what to do, you know, how you should feed your baby. And I guess it's similar to you launching your baby with this company. Um <laughs> This is for both of you, but when it comes to the consumer side of things, when it comes to sort of telling your grandmother or telling people you know what you do and how it's going to impact their lives or change how moms can feed their kids, can you talk a little bit about maybe the early stage consumer research or the sort of focus groups that you're doing right now? When it comes to consumer outreach, what will your marketing really have to consider when you launch? Because there's so much stigma and unnecessary judgment around moms feeding their children infant formula, but there's also an equally strong lobby almost about, you know, how it has to be breast milk. It has to be from the mother and it has to be for six months. Uh, do you think it's going to be easy to convince either set of people to switch to a product that's more like breast milk made from cells and not an infant formula? And do you think this group of consumers, mothers, do they care about things beyond nutrition? Do they care about environment or sustainability? We know that you said you don't want to guilt them into choosing this. But is nutrition going to be the sort of fulcrum on which you sell your product? You are hitting all of our deepest, darkest questions right on the head. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think one thing we've been very thoughtful about how we talk about it, and it's because it's the way we talk about it inside, is breastfeeding is an incredibly important and vital process to all of humanity, and we have no interest in replacing it. We think it is a beautiful process for many mothers, and we know that it is a really challenging process for many mothers. And whether you successfully breastfeed today or don't, we celebrate you. We just want to be a support for you as a parent. And we understand from Layla's own personal experience and now from the experience of getting it from everyone else, we deeply, deeply understand how hard this is. You're just trying to make the best decisions to feed your child. And, you know, it's the fundamental driver of wanting to protect and help your child thrive, right? We truly believe that our product fits really beautifully in as another option for parents rather than trying to replace options that exist now. And so approach all of our conversations, whether it's someone who's incredibly supportive of our product or incredibly unsupportive as, you know, how can we help support you? What can we do to help you? And so we see even as, you know, we've had a lot of press attention and we of course have people posting on Facebook or Twitter, even as we see people posting, you know, oh, that's unnatural, or I would never feed that to my child, even amongst these groups of people who may not be a target audience, maybe they don't believe as strongly in the science, or they're not as confident about things that don't come out of the human body. There's always one or two women or parents that stand up out of the group and say, you may not need this product, but there are millions of women throughout the world who do. And it's always like almost brings tears to our eyes because we don't have to defend ourselves or our consumers who need this. There are women out there already doing that work for us because this is such a fundamental issue for women throughout the world. And so it has been absolutely inspiring the number of women that we've received messages from through our website. It is inspiring the number of messages that we receive through social media of people saying, you know, this product isn't for me or I not having kids or I've already had my kids, but thank you. Thank you for doing this. I can't believe it's taken us this long to apply technology to a sector that's so important to women. And like, thank you for pushing forward for all of womankind. And so in terms of consumer acceptance, there will always be some people who don't support our product or it's not for them and they're not interested. But the overwhelming response that we've received of positivity and of excitement and of passion for what we're doing, we feel pretty confident that we've really hit a fundamental need, one of the most fundamental needs that humanity experiences. 
And uh, we don't have to do a large amount of convincing a parent to convert to this. We just have to provide the facts. We have to provide a high quality, efficacious and safe product that we would feed our own kids and let them make a decision because it is a clear winner nutritionally. And when you look at the sustainability halo on top of that, it's a no brainer for a lot of parents to be able to have accessibility to this product. That's incredibly exciting. And also some of the things that we haven't yet mentioned, you know, as the cost curves continue to bend downwards over time and we think about the developing world. These are things that we talk about on this show all the time. And in general, Michelle, you and I have talked about this all the time. We really need to think about how we bring the problems of emerging markets, the problems of Southeast Asia, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, the portion of the world that is going to continue to be 50, 60% of the world's population through 2050 online in this sector, right? And that means if there's intergenerational anemia that's being passed down from right from adolescent women all the way to when they have kids and are, and are breastfeeding and are tragically unable to pass through essential nutrients, folic acid, iron, all of these things, we really need to think about how we can attack those problems as well. It might take much longer than the first iterations of these products, but all the work that's ongoing in the biggest foundations in the world, you know, breast milk microbiome projects, trying to think through how to apply technology to improve infant formula, even if this is complementary to breastfeeding, I want to touch on all of that when we come back from this very short break. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. Some really fun guests on the network this week. Cyrus welcomed Dia Mirza to come and have a conversation about all kinds of different things. Danny Morrison was on Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast. If you haven't heard that, that's always a fun listen. And Raul Subramani was on Football Should Ball to grow their ever more exciting list of guests. And it's not just that. Ramantra Muk, the old friend of ours, was on Advertising is Dead. Manupalai was on the Filter Poffee podcast. It's been one great guest after the other. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome back to Feeding 10 Billion. We're with Michelle Egger and Dela Strickland of Biomilk. Michelle, I want to pose you a question. Especially during this time, there's going to be a huge impact on general services focused on development indicators, right? In places like India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, what we were talking about before the break. This includes things like vaccinations. So I've read research that says something like 70% of vaccinations will have been interrupted during the lockdown period in India. Uh, But it also includes nutrition programs and significant portions of children, including sometimes infants, depend on these food security programs for nutrition in places like India. Could you lay out the positive case for biomilk for how it moves beyond initially perhaps applications in the West and what impact do you think it has in infant nutrition, particularly its path to market in places like India? Yeah, I mean, one of the questions that keeps me up at night is how do I make sure this product gets into the hands of parents who need it and not just continuing to advantage babies who are born to wealthy parents? Because it could very easily be an elite product that perpetuates elitism both here in the West and throughout the world. And we don't want that. We want to make sure that the infants that truly have a fundamental nutritional need, which is all babies, but some babies more than others right now, as we look at the developing world, have access. And We don't have an answer. I mean, that's like the frank, painful solution of it is we don't yet have a line of sight to be able to launch in India in the next few years. And we get so many amazing stories being sent to us from mothers all over the world asking, when will this product be in Indonesia? When will it be in India? My entire family hasn't been able to breastfeed. What can I pay to get this? And the answer is, we don't know. But the fact that I think we're even willing to stay up late and try to figure it out says a lot about how we're thinking about this product and how we're looking at our unit economic spaces to be able to build a sustainable platform to launch from and then be able to expand. And so for us, I mean, one of the beautiful things about our technology versus maybe the cultivated meat space that you've spent more time talking about is, you know, we're more dairy shepherds than we are cattle ranchers. We're raising cells, we're keeping them happy, safe, healthy, we're giving them all they need to eat, and they're producing the milk. And because of that, our unit economic cost basis enables us to actually get to the price parity of infinite formula at the point where we're launching more broadly. So we can hit the price points that are seen here in the U.S. and on an ounce to ounce basis are pretty confident that we can be price competitive at the point where we would show up on a standard store shelf. And so then the question is, all right, well, you can be price competitive in the U.S., but what does that look like for the rest of the world and how do you expand? 
And for us, a lot of our thought has been around what does that look like in terms of partnerships? So obviously the first foray is trying to get milk into the hands of aid agencies, of foundations, of other groups who are going into more situations that are more like disaster relief or war or famine and providing product in the short term to be able to get to the babies who need it most quickly. And then in the longer term, it's probably working with NGOs and some of these organizations for a broader depth of launch to either come through some kind of payer system, so to actually be a product that can come through a healthcare setting, or looking to being a a blended kind of fortified product. So one of the beautiful things about our technology is we're leapfrogging all of the companies that are doing NHMO here or a fatty acid there, and in theory are producing all of the components of breast milk that are nutritionally relevant. And so if we're overproducing and that price point is impossible to bring down where we can get to the lower income consumer and low and middle income countries, the question then is, is there a blend somewhere in the middle that maybe it's not 100% looks identical to breast milk out of the body, but is 10x better than what anything else that's on the market as an infant formula today. And so as we think about scaling more broadly and trying to reach as many babies as possible, this kind of interim position where we're trying to drag down the cost positioning is really appealing to us as a way to maybe get broader depth and then partner with other large organizations, either private companies or institutions that can help us get access to more people and get into the hands of babies that really need it. We had an advisor, this is kind of a strange aside, but we had an advisor who I was talking to who was saying parts of India, there's someone who works on their board who spends a lot of time as a plastic surgeon doing pro bono cleft lip um, surgery. That's such a tangible way to think about why a child can't breastfeed and that there are parts of the world where it's actually a lot easier to talk about why breastfeeding is challenging because you can physically see a baby that can't latch. And that really the babies who are totally in need are the ones where everything seems like it should be fine. And everyone else around is asking a mother, why aren't you doing better? And so trying to get into the hands of the non-obvious cases is something that we think really deeply about both accessibility here in the U.S. and abroad of how are we going to be able to get into the hands of mothers where it looks like it might just be a mom not trying hard enough. And we know that that's not fundamentally the case. And how do we get the access to her directly rather than trying to go through all of these intermediaries who are going to continue to tell her it's her fault rather than really addressing the underlying issues that are there. And so Like I said, we don't have clear answers. We spend so much time deeply worrying and thinking about this. And as we find people coming out of the woodwork with distinct backgrounds or options or thoughts, we welcome them. We always take referrals. We take all our calls. We're happy to talk to anybody who thinks they may have a better way of expanding quickly so that we can reach as many moms as possible. Since we're on the topic of infant nutrition, you mentioned HMOs. Those are human milk oligosaccharides. They're not available through plant-based milks, for instance, right? So this is something that, I mean, as an adult, it wouldn't be essential for me to get human milk oligosaccharides from my diet. But for an infant, this is exactly what we're talking about. In those first 1,000 days, that's exactly what you need. And plant-based milks cannot supply that. So if you're looking for something that is sustainable and that hits all the nutritional parameters, really, this is the solution, right? And if we forget India for a second, but we might see the path to market in general look like perhaps even blended products, like you said. Those could be complements to breastfeeding or or whatever, right? There's a lot that needs to be figured out, but I think paths to market will emerge over time. Yeah, I think one interesting thing, so I had never been exposed to plant-based infant formulas before I started this project. It wasn't just, just wasn't a world that I had ever really considered existed. And as you look nutritionally, you know, my food scientist hat on, and you look at one of the backs of those labels, when you're talking soy isolates, you're talking sugar solids, caramel coloring. (laughs) I mean, all kinds of things that really, they're not providing the fundamental nutrition necessary. And so I think the sentiment behind it is so beautiful in that you don't want to take away a mother from another mammal to feed your own child, or you don't want to have the animal welfare issues that go with it. But fundamental nutrition setting for a child is so, so, so important. I'm so excited to be able to help tap into that market and provide a much better option for families like that. So I had a question. It's actually a two-pronged question. You know, you mentioned earlier that you don't have babies in Congress. This is not something that's going to be easy to sort of regulate or legislate. And so I wanted to know what is the path to market in the U.S. currently? Like what are the barriers or what are the hurdles you need to sort of cross before this gets to market? We hear this all the time about how the science around 
nutrition or medical needs for women are always underfunded, ignored, or simply sort of pushed behind as not as urgent as many other things. Do you foresee that as an issue when you raise more funds as you get to the market? And from all these learnings that you had, you know, sort of creating this company, what advice would you give someone in India trying to do something similar, you know, create an alternative protein product, say beyond meat, eggs and dairy? How would you advise them on how they should develop and launch their product in a market like India? I'll answer your question to you first, and then I'll let Layla jump in. In terms of entrepreneurship in India versus the US, obviously I'm not a, an entrepreneur in India. So like, I just want to, to clarify upfront, like I'm a privileged white woman that got to go to a top 20 business school and has had all kinds of support from family and friends in my life to be able to take the risk of starting a business. I don't take that privilege lightly in that entrepreneurship, it's a risky game. Like it's kind of the same personality as a criminal or a gambler in some ways. And so I do really acknowledge that I've had so much opportunity in my life that's kind of come to this moment for me to take my shot. But that being said, you know, I had a similar question I was asked by Forbes around how is it being a female entrepreneur? And I'll say the same thing I said for that is I think the most successful entrepreneurs are people who have had to be resilient in their life. They've been told no, or they've hit obstacles, or they've naturally been discriminated against or had challenging experiences that have really taught them how to work around things and how to think about a problem that there has to be a solution. And one of the things Layla and I really credit ourselves with so far with our success is that we're like painful eternal optimists. Probably one of our downfalls too, to be honest. But we are just those people who believe if you can think it, you can do it. There has to be a way to make this work. And we just continue to iterate and think and move and push and see how we can push forward on things where we're hearing a no or it doesn't seem possible. And so I would say when you think about in any part of the world, a lot of that ability as an entrepreneur, especially in the era of COVID, is just to be resilient, to not take no as an answer. If you think it's a problem to solve and you feel so fundamentally driven to solve it, it's probably because your consumer needs that solution. And so if you can be a tireless advocate for someone and you believe so wholeheartedly in that what you're doing is right, it's probably you're fighting so hard because it's not for you, it's for someone else. And so I really do think entrepreneurs who are successful, they have this ability to just ignore the fact that people may dismiss them or may think that it's them or not be helpful or not remove roadblocks. And if they can get around those and really find the fortitude in themselves to represent their consumers in that problem, you can overcome almost anything, which I know sounds super easy saying versus doing. So I apologize (laughs) to everyone listening to this who's like, yeah, but some of these obstacles are crappy. Yeah, they really, (laughs) really are. But if you can find a way around them, you're golden. If you can find your way through COVID right now as an entrepreneur, you have learned so much more than someone who had tried to start a business two years ago. And I truly believe that right now we're going to see some amazing technologies and companies come forward because people who are naturally resilient are pushed to represent the people who have a problem and need it solved. And I'll, I'd love to kind of backtrack a little bit and go back to talk what you were asking about before about sort of the path to go to market and how we're formulating that and looking at it, you know, sort of as the CSO, I'm thinking a lot about the technology, of course, and have a number of technological hurdles to address. But I strongly feel actually that what's most innovative about what we're doing is actually the product itself and not the technology that we're using to create it. So these are engineering problems that I have a lot of optimism and belief that we'll be able to resolve technologically, but I think there are, our product itself raises a whole bunch of questions that are different even than if we were making bovine milk. So, you know, human milk is presumably the first human cell-based product to be made commercially. And as Michelle alluded to also, you know, we're one of the first companies where you have this really, it's a very wet bench, wet science, (laughs) cell biology company of women solving a problem that really affects women. And we're trying to create a product that has no standard of identity. And we don't know enough about it from a basic science perspective to even think about, can we call what we're making actually milk? Because what is milk? Because it's different in every single sample you look at. And so some of these are the things that we need to engage with a variety of different stakeholders and communities in order to start to get a sense of how to actually bring this product to market. So of course, for us, we know here in the US, our regulatory process is going to be very important. We don't yet know exactly what form that's going to take. We are pretty proactive and collaborative about engaging with that early on. 
And regardless of what the outcome for our regulatory process actually is, we do know that our product will sink or swim based on the trust of our customers and consumers and whether people will actually feel comfortable and happy to feed this to their babies. And so that's going to require a lot of demonstration through evidence that the product is fully safe and efficacious. And so we expect to do a lot of testing with this product, both in animals, even in adult populations, before we would feed it to infants. From a consumer standpoint, we know that the thought process and the decision process around what you feed your infant is different than, say, deciding to try a cool new cell-based meat. (laughs) Um, It's a different thing. You know, you're talking about an entire complete source of nutrition that is the only person who can make this decision for your baby. And so just that whole process is so unique for our particular product. And so we're really, that's sort of why, in addition to pushing forward with the technology, we're really thinking upfront a lot about those aspects and how this product actually sits in a marketplace and what that looks like and how we get there. One of the beautiful things about being a women-led company, one woman with children, one of a childbearing age, the fundamental questions of what would I want to know has happened to make me comfortable to feed this to my own child is really visceral. As someone who wants to have a family myself and not going to get away without feeding my child biomilk at the point where I have children, you know, I think we really fundamentally feel those trade-offs and those choices and those decisions. And so when we think about safety and efficacy testing, it's not just like lip service to something that has to be done. We're feeding the most precious beings on the planet to each and every individual person. We don't take that lightly. So our regulatory framework might look a little more robust than other companies in and around the cell ag space, but that's because we take our responsibility for it really seriously. All right. So I have a question that you may not be able to answer, but I'm going to take a crack at it. So what's the five-year plan? Where's Biomilk going to be five years or even 10 years from now? Yeah, five years from now, definitely a launched product. If we haven't launched by five years, please just end it all for me. Uh, I don't know that I can continue at this breakneck speed. And we really want to be able to be a company that provides answers for parents, that provides enough information where they feel like they're getting what they need to make an informed decision. You know, five years from now feels like a lifetime. One year has been life-changing for all of us throughout the entire world. So five years from today in the era of COVID, it's like hard to even imagine what life looks like. But we hope that our consumers can take solace in that infant nutrition doesn't change. Like the fundamental needs of a child, whether we're in the middle of a pandemic or not, are not different. And so we're incredibly laser focused on what those needs are and want to come to market full circle now to what I said at the beginning and the most ethically and sustainably way that we can. And so we're really excited to have product in market, probably mainly D to C to start direct to consumer. We think that there's a lot of value in being able to have that direct relationship with our first customers. And then from there, figuring out how we scale. So in 10 years, how do we scale to the world? And not only are we looking at infant nutrition, but you know, long term, this technology is applied to all mammalian types of animals on the planet. Um, and so obviously there are implications for cow's milk, which is commonly drank, goat's milk, which of course is very popular in other parts of the world, and all kinds of animals that have milk needs, both endangered species and not. We're really excited to serve. A quick aside, Layla's a huge horse enthusiast and has horses of her own, which I am not a horseback rider. So I always make I use like the most stunted language ever. Layla's literally laughing at me because I sound like a sociopath when I talk about horses in comparison to her. But there's a lot of industries out there that have some really insidious practices, including thoroughbred horse breeding, where we see horses being stripped from their new foals and being unable to feed their own babies because they're being forced to feed thoroughbreds. It's not just in the human population where there's really challenging breast milk issues. We see a lot of, you know, golden elixir of life issues throughout the animal kingdom. But long term as a company as Biomilk, you know, we're super focused on infants today, but have a lot of excitement for figuring out how we can solve problems in the future that aren't just applied to humans. That sounds amazing. I want to just round off this interview by asking you what we ask all our guests. It's the year 2050. What do you think we'll be feeding ourselves? I'm sure uh, bio milk will be all over the world by then. Uh, but can you paint a picture for what you think we'll be feeding and drinking at that point? And what will your day look like? Gosh, that's such an easy question to end on, Ramya. I mean, it's just such a simple and obvious answer. 
I think one of the things as a food scientist who has spent a lot of my career really focused on how people build food beliefs, this time is incredibly fascinating. You know, we have consumers who are really concerned about natural and organic products, GMOs, very concerned about the sources and locations of where things are coming from, but are also trying to find solutions that are climate neutral or even positive, um, which sometimes are at odds right now. You know, we see a lot of plant-based products being made out of the same monoculture crops, which are better maybe than meat in some ways, but maybe not nutritionally better for people. And in some ways, not necessarily better across agriculture as a whole. From a biodiversity side, my sister's a PhD plant biologist. So unfortunately, I can get pretty deep and dark here too. But I'm really excited and see so much promise in just the fact that consumers are asking a lot of questions right now. And most companies don't have the answers. If they try to tell you they do, they're lying. And so I hope by 2050, we're to a place where we have fewer questions and more answers and more comfortably people can align their food beliefs to the products that are out there rather than continuing to have to make trade-offs. So what are we eating? What are we drinking? You know, honestly, it's not my business. It's an individual personal food belief and I'm excited for people to be able to make their own decisions, but also find products that fulfill their needs without having to constantly make the trade-offs that we ask consumers to do today. And I would say similarly to that, I think, um, you know, to me, I feel so fortunate to be a cell biologist at this point in time, because I think that we are on the cusp or even really getting into an era where uh, cell biology and synthetic biology uh, really have the ability to to move us forward in terms of our natural resource utilization and have impacts um, that'll be very important in the future. I think that you know, what's been really astonishing and wonderful to watch over the even the last 10 years or so as a cell biologist is just this realization that we have spent decades developing this ability to grow cells outside the body. And we've really pointed it at biomedical applications and, of course, advanced and accelerated discovery in medicine for decades now. And it seems to be a sort of an increasing awareness now that perhaps we can use uh, this knowledge and point it and deploy it to address more emerging challenges that we're facing. And so it's a very exciting time for cell biology. I don't know all of the things we'll be eating and, and drinking in 2050, but I think cell biology is going to have an important role. I think synthetic biology and cellular agriculture in particular, you know, the promise of this field is really more efficient resource utilization, which is absolutely essential to support the population that we have. And so it's fairly simple to think about it, that we need to harvest instead of the entire animal and all of the needs that we need to meet in order to do that. It's pretty clear that a cell-based solution is going to be more efficient, less impactful, and really give you more control over the process and perhaps allow you to make better products even. And so I hope that by 2050, I'm relaxing on a horse farm (laughs) somewhere, but really enjoying the view of how things have progressed and that people are uh, able to thrive and flourish with less of an impact on our natural resources. Michelle and Leila, thank you so much for being on Feeding 10 Billion. It's been an absolute pleasure. I got into the alternative protein sector because I firmly believed that the technologies currently coming into play across the world are creating solutions to major global problems of climate change, biodiversity loss, and public health. And these are solutions which can be implemented within our lifetime. Having grown up in Mumbai, a particular area of interest for me personally has also always been the application of these technologies, the challenges which affect the developing world. The mission of companies like Biomilk and their Singapore-based counterparts, Turtle Tree Labs, is incredibly exciting because it gives us hope that we can help tackle these challenges as well as all those other major issues of sustainability and zoonotic disease facing the world. The alternative protein sector is indeed growing up. And as it does, it can have a big impact on child and infant nutrition as well. The world may look very different in 2050 as a result. And if you want to start a company in this space or are interested in just learning more about this sector as a researcher or want to collaborate, please do reach out. You can also join our GF Ideas India Smart Protein Innovation Community on LinkedIn or follow us on social media. We are Good Food India on Twitter and the Good Food Institute India on Instagram. And we leave all those URLs as well as the LinkedIn URL in our description. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. 
You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am at Varun D seven on Twitter and at Varun five on Instagram. You can come ask me why. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm Cryptic Caprice on Twitter and Dithering Funambulist on Instagram. Please don't ask me why. We look forward to having you with us every week. And of course, if you'd like to be part of accelerating the future of our food system, please just get in touch. You can email us at india at gfi dot org. My name is Varun Deshpande, Managing Director at the Good Food Institute India. And I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the Communication Specialist at the Good Food Institute India. And you have been a part of Feeding Ten Billion Season Two. Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc., etc. It's all content, and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content, and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. Namaskar, this is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times, but in these challenging times, we can create something extraordinary. Do take time to listen to my podcast, Begin the Journey, available on the IVM Podcasts website, app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember, we have a great opportunity called life. Cheers.